please bear with me this morning. I think I'm starting to come down with something. My voice has been a little bit raspy. I've had a sore throat the past couple days. Hopefully it's going to be nothing serious and it'll pass and just get through. <coughs> I got a pocket full of cough drops here. I bet I got to go through them by the time I get done today. We're going to open up your Bibles to Jonah. We're going to use one verse out of chapter 3 and then the first three verses out of chapter 4 this morning. And I have to admit that, you know, this is one of the harder messages for me to prepare from the book of Jonah. If you hear me preach before and get the sermons, I like to give encouraging messages. I like to give things from the Word of God that, that uplift us. But, you know, as a preacher, we're supposed to preach the whole counsel of God. So we got to a part in Jonah today where there's not a lot of encouragement in this chapter. Now, we're going to talk today about a, a pouting prophet. You know, that's the name of the message today. Because Jonah wasn't, wasn't very happy. But... Even though this isn't one of encouragement, it's more one of warning. It is one of my favorite books in the Bible. I think it was about maybe a year ago or so, maybe a little bit longer. There was a post in our, in our church community group on the, uh, who is your favorite Old Testament character and why? I had to think long and hard about it, and I remember my answer to that. I put it was Jonah. Amen. Because I can actually see myself a lot in Jonah. I can see the stubbornness that Jonah had. I can kind of see his hardened heart towards some of the people and some of the stuff we're going to talk about today. I can find myself behaving in that way. And someone says, you know, you learn more from your failures than you do from your successes. I think we can look at Jonah's failure and what he's gone through in this, and we can learn a lot today, and we can learn a lot about our own selves, and we can apply it to our lives and cause us to do some self-reflection. And what Jonah does have a big failure today I think there is a big, big lesson and points we can take away from it to improve our Christian lives. So in Jonah, starting off in chapter 3, verse 10, as I said, we'll read down through chapter 4, verse 3. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tar Tarshish, and I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us gather here in this free country to, to preach your word. I pray that your spirit fills me and guides me today, so I only may say what you want me to say. Let me get, go down any rabbit trails or anything that is my own thoughts, but only what is coming from your word. And I pray that you open the hearts of those listening so they may take something and apply it to their lives and it may be edifying to them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, man. And Joseph was not a very happy character here. At the end, of the night, he even wished for his death. Right? The first thing we notice from this passage is, man, Joseph, or not Joseph, Jonah was a pretty selfish person. He had a selfish displeasure. You know, Joseph, was, he was upset with God. He thought he knew better because God didn't punch Nineveh. And he did this because that was his own selfish attitude. Because he was not, his heart, it was not right with God. We may be that way sometimes. Our hearts are not right with God. And we want to see people get punished the way Jonah wanted to get punished. But it's only because of our own selfishness, our own heart and heart. And we get that way because of our prideful thoughts. Right? We begin to think they're more highly of ourselves than we are. Or that we are better than another group of people. Right? It has to how we get racism, prejudice in this world. Or we even might start to think that we know better than God. You know, and this has been a common problem among men since the beginning of time. The Bible gives us plenty of examples of how selfishness has hurt humankind. God has brought about judgment from God time after time after time. Look back in Genesis, before the flood came about, right? God said he was going to destroy the world because every thought was evil. Those evil thoughts, they were born out of selfish desires, people thinking more highly of themselves. Because we can look in chapter 4 of Genesis at the story of Lamech. Lamech. Does everybody know who Lamech is? Heard that story, right? He's a descendant of Cain. You know, Cain was selfish and slew his brother because God didn't accept his sacrifice, well, Lamech takes that selfishness to a whole other level, because in chapter 4, verses 23 through 24 says, And Lamech said unto his wives, Adah and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, 
Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. What Lamech is saying here, he's like, hey, I just killed a man because he hurt my feelings. He stepped on my toes. He did something wrong to me. And I went ahead and killed him. And you know what? Nothing's going to happen to me. It's a selfish attitude that thinks, you know, I'm better than that person. I'm better than the rest of the world. I'm even better than Cain because if God was only going to punish Cain or avenge him sevenfold, well, me, I'm so special, it's going to be 77-fold. It's our selfish attitude, thinking we're better. In the book of Judges, you know, we go all throughout that book. It's a selfish attitude of men that at the end it says what? That they did what was right in their own eyes. They're being selfish. So God constantly had to raise up judges to save them from their selfishness. And they go through a little time of a revival there, and then soon they'd be right back to doing the same old thing. They'd turn on to their selfish ways. Eventually they got the kings. And during the time of kings, you think maybe people would start to learn. But no, we are, we are creatures of habit. We have that selfish attitude. You know, even after Israel was conquered by Assyria, you would think maybe the people of Judah would start to listen to the word of God. They would start to listen to the prophets that were telling them, repent of your ways. Stop thinking what you are doing is right. Turn to the ways of God. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, it tells us, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his word and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought him the, upon them the king of the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young men or maiden, old men, or him that stooped for age, he gave them all unto his hands. It was God's, or people's selfishness that caused God to bring that judgment upon them. Time after time after time, selfishness brings judgment. And we know as New Testament Christians, we got some judgment coming for us soon, one day, right? It's told on the Bible, and we are right now living in those last days, the time before that judgment. The second Timothy three one says, This you know also that in the last day perilous times shall come. And I think we can all look around and we can see that, right? What are the characteristics of these perilous times, right? It's no doubt the crime that we see going on around us. The the political corruptions, the moral indecency, the taking over of the LGBTQ, the trans community, taking over everything. And and of course it's religious hypocrisy, right? That's all the things. Well, all those things are bad, right? But no, what does verses 2 and 3 say? It says, Know that the last days perilous times will come, so men shall be lovers of their own selves. Men are going to start to become selfish. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Boy, doesn't that sound how Jonah was acting right there. And can't we look out into the world and we can see that all around us. And we're quick to condemn those kind of actions. We're quick to condemn when we see other people doing that. Anybody just watched the opening ceremonies to the Olympics? Heard anything about it? Right? We condemn those people. We condemn the way that they mocked the Last Supper. The way that they flaunted their transsexuality out in front of everybody. And they praised it as good. You know, we look in what's going on in Arkansas right now and had the coalition of the of the feminists trying to get abortion onto our ballot and how they celebrated when they got those signatures and when they turned it in and they threw a little party. We celebrated and we're easy. We can look at them. And we can say, yes, you are lovers of yourselves. You guys are acting in an ungodly way. But that's not what Jonah's teaching us here. Jonah's teaching us we need to look inside at ourselves because not only they are like that and we should call them out, that is true, but we need to look at ourselves, at our moral beings, are our selfishness, and how are we behaving that way? If God had sent you to speak to those people in the Olympics and told you to give them the gospel, would you want to do that? Would you want to do that with a happy heart? Would you want to see them turn to the Lord, or would you have it in the back of your mind? Well, I hope they get what they deserve. I hope they get the punishments that's coming towards them. I can tell you personally, sometimes those thoughts creep into my mind. Those thoughts creep into my mind when I think about people pushing for abortion rights. I'm like, they don't deserve a chance, but that's not what God tells us. That's not what God wants us to be. And that's what we're learning from Jonah today. That we cannot be selfish because when these last days are come, they're perilous. It's because people of God are becoming selfish. People of God are becoming boasters. They're not spreading the word of God. They're not spreading his love. They're not drawing people into Christ. We're not bringing people into the kingdom because we think we're better. 
because we're holding selfish, righteous attitudes. Instead of preaching the gospel, we're just like, hey, I'm going to take care of me and mine, and I'm going to let everybody else just fend for themselves and do, and what happened to them happens, right? We should be more concerned about the damage we can do to ourselves and the damage we can do to God, stuff that we can control others. We should be more concerned about our own behavior than the behavior of others, right? While we need to condemn them, we need to watch out for themselves. You know, D.L. Moody used to say, the man I fear the most is the one who walks underneath this hat. You know, we have to watch out for our own selves, our own righteousness. When Abraham Lincoln, he was running for president, a reporter once asked him, you know, do you fear any of your opponents? And he said, yes, there's one opponent I fear. Porter, he was somewhat surprised. He said, well, which one? Lincoln responded by saying, a man named Lincoln. If I am defeated, I will be defeated by a man named Lincoln. You know, it is our own selfish pleasures, displeasure, like Jonah, that will bring us to our downfall. It's our own prideful thoughts that cause us to be this way. And when we have these prideful thoughts, and we look down upon each other, each other's, you know what? It also brings into our lives, it brings in some jealous tendencies. We start to get jealous of what other people have. And in Proverbs 6.34, tells us that, that jealousy is the rage of man. Nothing good comes from jealousy that causes us to rage. Because Jonah was selfish, because Jonah was prideful, he probably just came, remember, he just came out of that whale. He was just punished for his disobedient behavior. He probably wanted those other people in Assyria. You know, they're wicked, awful people. They didn't trust God. They didn't know God. They weren't living godly in any way. They got no punishment at all. That probably made Jonah a little bit jealous. He's like, God, why aren't you giving them some whale time? Where's their punishment at? Right? But that's not the attitude we need to have. And we can be that same way. We can want that punishment to come on other people. And we get jealous. And we get angry at God when that does not happen. You know, we can illustrate that with a couple stories. And there's been no better storyteller in the world than Jesus. So let's go, just go to a couple of his parables and, and use what Jesus taught us, right? How about the parable of the prodigal son? When the, he went away from his uh, father and he got his inheritance and he went out and he blew it all. He decided to come back. Man, the father was happy to see him. Who wasn't happy? That other brother. He was selfish. He was jealous. He's like, why isn't this happening to me? And what did his father tell him? He said, you're always here. You always have the things that I have. But my son, who once was lost, was now found. We need to rejoice when people come to the Lord, when people return. Not be angry and say, well, how come you're celebrating for them? Why aren't you celebrating for me? Another parable? What about the workers in the vineyard? Right? No matter how long, is, if you hear the story, right? The guy went to, uh, to hire some people to work, and he hired them and said, I'll pay you a penny for the full day. Then he went back at the sixth hour, and again at the ninth hour, and again and again, and he brought them all in to work in his field. And at the end of the day, he started with the people that had worked the less and gave them a penny. So the people that were coming up after that thought, well, I'm surely going to get more. What did they get? They got a penny. They got what was promised to them. They got jealous. They got angry. They thought they deserved more. We have that in our hearts, too. When we see people come to Christ, they get the same reward we get. They get everlasting life through belief in Jesus Christ, just like we do. But we don't want to see that. We want to think sometimes we get selfish. We get jealous. We think we've been, we've been saved longer. We've been working for God longer. We deserve more than that person. Well, we're not promised anymore. God just says, believe on me and I will give you everlasting life. He will show mercy who he wants to show mercy to. When we behave in such a manner like this, we're not walking in the spirit, but rather we're walking in the flesh. We're taking after the devil himself. Because the devil, he is the, the original selfish, jealous creature. Right? In Isaiah 41, you know, the devil says, he says, For thou hast said in his heart, the devil, he says, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That sounds pretty selfish to me. And he's being jealous there. He's not only thinking and prideful, thinking that he can be on par with God. He's jealous of what God has. When we behave in the way, we're, we are acting no better than the devil was here in, in Isaiah. But we may be like Jonah. We may still go through the motions. We may be, act like a creature of light, act like we are a good creature. You know, even, even Satan himself, even the devil can, can pose himself as a creature of the light. We can exhibit loving kindness outwardly. 
You know, we can go out and we can tell, tell people about Jesus. We can do it reluctantly only because we feel like we have to, like it's our duty. But we're not doing it out of a correct heart. When we're not doing it out of a correct heart, we do not reap the fruits of our labor. We're not filled with the Spirit. We do not produce the Spirit in our lives. You know, like it says in Galatians, that the, the fruits of the Spirit, right? We're not producing love. We're not producing peace. We're not producing goodness, temperance. And most importantly, we're not producing any joy in our lives by just going through the motion and pretending to be a good Christian. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 through 5, the Bible reads, Fulfill ye my joy. You know what? Fulfill my joy. Be joyful that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Right? We're not supposed to go out and do stuff out of anger. We're not supposed to do stuff because we're being vain, because we are proud, because we are selfish, because we are jealous. But no, but in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to avoid that selfishness. Look on the things of others. If we want to have true joy, that's what we will do. Jonah's demonstrated that his heart was not in the right place. That he was just going through the motions. He had no joy. In fact, he had what selfishness and pride and jealousy they all lead to. My second point here, he had a, he had a surly disposition. Boy, was he angry. It says, though, in, in verse 1, it says, but it, pleased God, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. You know, I've heard it said before that anger is just one letter away from danger. We need to watch our hearts when that happens, right? And anger in itself, if you were to study the Bible, anger in itself is, is not a sinful emotion. It is an emotion given to us by God, because the Bible does say in Ephesians 4.26, Be ye angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. But what the Bible's teaching us here is, is for righteous indignation, angry, what angers God. But even then, even when we have that kind of anger, which is not being displayed in Jonah, I'm going to say that again, is not what we're talking about here. But even when we have that kind of anger, there's some qualifiers there, right? To be angry but sin not. Do not let that sun go down upon your wrath. It's not easy to be angry and to sin not. Even if you don't let that sun go down, you don't let it go down upon your wrath, right? I heard someone would say, I get angry, but I'm all over it in a minute. Like, that's nothing. We know it only takes about 30 seconds for a nuclear bomb to go off and destroy everything. That anger for one minute can be as devastating as being angry as a whole day. Other times our anger, it can linger. It can turn into bitterness if we let hold on to it. It's best to follow biblical principles. It's best to be slow to anger, as it says in Ecclesiastes 7.9. The Bible reads, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for angry, anger resteth in the bosom of fools. It's repeated in James 1, 19, 20, where the Bible tells us, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, or slow to anger. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When we let anger come into our hearts, we're not being righteous as God wants us to be. Instead, we're going back to that selfish attitude. We're going back to that jealous attitude. We're going back to looking inwardly and not being Christ-like. And we're not working the righteousness of God. But you know what it does worketh? It worketh in with all a bad attitude. It makes us all surly. And it can be seen by all. Have you ever known someone that Jonah that was so angry in a time of happiness? When everybody around you should have been rejoicing, right? This is the greatest revival in history. All these people came to know God. Everybody should be very happy. And everybody was happy. Except for that one man, the man of God the one that should be rejoicing, right? Have you ever seen the people? I've seen people that could be at weddings and see people there and be sitting over in the corner by themselves and you can just look at them and you know that they're angry, that somebody else has found happiness in their lives. Or maybe you're at a birthday party, you know? Or it could be like the, the stereotypical old man, get off my lawn anger, you know? I had this happen as a kid. I grew up in a small town in central Illinois, a town of 350 people. And, you know, we used to get together as a community, me and all the little boys there. We liked to play ball. And I had a house that was here. I had a friend that had a house that was over here. Another one had one that was here. But this house that was directly behind my house had a big old yard in it. But, man, we could not go into that yard. I never saw the lady. Her name was Edna. 
But if we ever went in her yard, you can bet that her window was going to open up and she was going to yell at us, you kids get off my yard. What are you doing out there? I mean, it got to the point where we were even scared to let our ball just fly out of one yard to go in there. We were scared to run over there and get it. You know, what makes a person so angry like that? We didn't understand it at the time. But as I got older and I came to know, she had lost a husband. She had lost a kid early in her life to an accident. And it caused this lady to shut herself up at her home. And she was angry at the whole world. It wasn't nothing that we had done. It was just her anger and her bitterness and her poor attitude because she had let it linger on too long. You know what else what anger does, though? It not only causes us to have a bad attitude, it causes us to separate ourselves from other people. Anger causes us to stop doing the things that we like to do. Instead of being somewhere and letting others see our anger, we're like, well, I'm just too angry. I can't be around that person. I'm just going to pull away. So that way I don't go out there and I don't say anything that hurts anybody. Have you ever been that way? Have you ever been so angry right now that you say, I'm just so angry, I can't stand to be around you. I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm just going to pull away from you. You know, I've had that happen to me. This is convicting to me because you all that are in here are regulars. You've heard about the stories and the troubles I've had with my coworker at work. We've gotten into some arguments. We've gotten in times where she's been angry at me and I've been angry at her. And I let that anger linger and I just, I just sit in my office. I don't want to be anywhere around her. I don't want to be anywhere near her. Is it hurting her at all? No, not at all. Not one bit. I'm the one missing out. I'm not the one going in the break rooms talking with my coworkers, the ones that I do like. I'm missing out on my fellowship with them. You know, I'm missing out on things I want to do because I'm holding anger and resentment against someone else. You know, it's, it, it can build up. Wives, you ever gave the silent treatment to your husband? They thinking you're going to punish him, right? I'm going to show him. I'm just not going to talk to him all day long. Amen. Oh, boy, guys, guys are like, hey, don't, don't, don't threaten me with a good time, right? You know, women think that they're punishing. They think they're laying down the law here. But at the end of the day, are, are the guys any wiser? No, they think they just had a nice, relaxing day. And while all along, you've let it build up inside you. And you've built up that anger. you build up that resentment. And that anger and that resentment, that point, it can build up sometimes. Not all the times, but it can build up sometimes where we start to feel like Jonah did at the end of our passage. Where we just want to completely separate ourselves from the entire world. What does it say there in verse 3? It says, Therefore, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. That is the ultimate separation. That's what anger can lead to. Wanting to get away from everything. You know, a person in this situation, they're desperate. They believe it's their only hope. But they got that way through their own selfish attitudes. Through their own jealousy and through their own anger. And they think that, you know, this is the only way to make the lives of others better. Is for me to step away. Edwin Scheinman, though, he's an American clinical psychologist a suicidologist, and he co-founded the Los Angeles Suicide Prevention Center. This is a building where they researched suicide and they developed a crisis center and treatments to prevent deaths. He's quoted as saying, the act of suicide is the ultimate selfish act. It assumes that the individual's pain is greater than the pain of those left behind. But that's where our selfishness and our anger can take us. It can lead us to that point if we do not check ourselves. We definitely need to watch our hearts and never let our surliness, our selfishness, get us to that point or get us to the point to do the last thing that Jonah did here in this passage. He had a, a slanderous defense. He was speaking bad about God. What does it say there in verse 4-2? He says, He prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? He said, God, didn't I tell you you were going to do this? Didn't I tell you so? Don't I know better than you? Oh, wow. We don't always understand why God chooses to do what he does. But it's not our job to tell him he's wrong. Who are we? We are the creation, not the creator. How arrogant would you have to be to look at God, to pray to God and say, God, I know you're going to do this and you're just not right. They didn't deserve it. No. As we've heard plenty of times from behind this pulpit, Isaiah 55 tells us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts 
higher than your thoughts. We don't always have to understand what God is doing. But we have to accept it. We don't need to get surly about it. We don't need to get angry about it. You know, we don't even have the right to demand answers from God. We don't even have the right. We can ask him why. We can cry out him why. But we don't have a right to demand for him to tell us. You know, we learned that from the book of Job. Right? Job was a righteous man who had some, some terrible things happen into his life. We go through there and his friends come in and he gets near the end and Job starts demanding some answers from God. And if you ever think that you deserve answers from God, if you ever think that you know more than God, if you ever think that, God, you are, you tell me, and you want to demand it, read Job 38 through 39, right? As Job 38, 4 says, God saying to Job, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare it if thou hast understanding. God saying, no, I'm more powerful than you, I'm more knowledgeable than you. I do not have to answer to you. Like I said, if you ever suggest, go and read those two chapters, and you're going to realize just how much we cannot understand, how much we cannot control, and just how powerful our God is as he hammers Job's with questions. You know, just kind of paraphrase on this. He says, were you there when the sea and the land were created and they were separated? Were you there when I separated the darkness and the light? You know, were you there to see how the storms are created, to know their power thereof, and how I can control them, and I can pour out my wrath when I want? Were you there to see when the animals were created and how they work together in unison to our life? Do you know any of this? Who are you to question me? Who are you to say that you're better than me? It will humble us when you read that passage. It will humble us just like it did Job. We have no choice to come to the same conclusion as the psalmist did in Psalm 145, 17, that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. No, we don't need to think that we're better than God. Don't think we need to know better or question him on why he does what he does. We come to him in faith. We come to him in trust. We come to him knowing that all things are going to work together for those that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose, as it tells us in Romans 8, 28. We don't say, God, you were wrong. You made a mistake here. God makes no mistakes. But Jonah also slandered God by, by claiming, you know what? He said, God, it's your fault that I was disobedient. You made me do this. Right? As it said there in verse 2, the Bible continues on in Jonah. says, Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and a merciful God, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. You know, it's dangerous to blame the Lord when we're suffering, when thing comes on. And we don't need to tell God, you know, you did this to me. But we do it. We've heard people say it. God, why are you doing this to me? God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? This isn't fair, God. I don't deserve this. As we say, praise God that we don't get what we deserve. Right? We should never get into the thought that God is tempting us or God is putting stuff in our way, causing us to behave in a way that's ungodly, causing us to sin. God's not there to trip us up. James 1, 13 through 14 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. It's our own selfishness. It's our own jealousy. It's our own anger that draws us away, that draws us into sin. It is not God tempting us. In fact, it's God that pulls us back by his grace and his mercy. When our own lusts lead us into sin, it is God that brings us back. As it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no temptation that has taken you, but it's common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but with the temptation also make it a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Our God is a loving God. He is not causing us to sin. He is giving us a way out of sin. But most importantly, when we think God is being unfair to us, we need to turn our eyes to Christ. We need to turn our eyes to, cro to the cross. Turn our eyes to the sinless God that came to this earth. And look at how he suffered. Look what he went through. The mighty pain that he suffered so unjustly. If anybody was treated unfair, it was Christ Jesus. If anyone didn't deserve what happened to him, it was Christ Jesus. But he did it all and he bore it all so that we may be free. So that our suffering may be only for a short time. That one day we will have eternal life in heaven because Jesus Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice. He suffered the ultimate 
mistreatment. And he did it quietly. He, or he didn't open his mouth. There was no deceit found in his mouth, no guile. He went to the cross and he took it. If Christ can do that for us, and we say that we have Christ inside of us, we need to display that Christ-like attitude. We need to show that Holy Spirit. We need to remember what was written in Isaiah, that his ways are greater than our ways. You know, we would have never thought, we would think in our human mind, there's got to be a way to redeem man than for God to come to earth and die. But no, God says that's the only way. It must be done. You know, we got to think of God's response to Job. And it's reiterated in the book of Romans in the New Testament in chapter 9, verses 18 through 21. The book of Romans reads, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom will he hardeneth? Thou will say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Who are you to say, God, you are doing wrong? We have no spot to reply against them. Shall the formed thing say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the powder, power, potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? God is powerful. God will do what he wants. And we should never slander him and think that he is out to get us, or he is causing evil in our lives, because all good things come from God. So how do we wrap this up today? we got just, just three words. Don't be Jonah. Right? <laughs> Don't be a Jonah. Let the pouting prophet be an example of how not to behave. You know, we need to do, as we are instructed in Corinthians 13.5, that tells us to examine ourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, Know ye not that your own selves, how that Christ Jesus is in you, except you be reprobates? Every day, we need to remember, we need to know that Christ is in us. First thing in this morning, we need to remember that our bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost, that he is living inside us. He dwells within us. And then pray that he fills us with the Spirit, that, that he enlightens us every day, so that way we can bear his fruits. We can have joy, love. We have peace in our lives. Pray that our hearts remain soft. They don't get hardened like Jonah's, right? And we start, and we focus on the loving, the forgiving nature of God instead of the bitterness and wrath of Jonah. Pray that selfishness does not sneak in that can lead to anger and us ultimately slandering God because that is not who we are called to be. And the only way we're going to do that is by staying in his word and staying full of the Holy Spirit and not being a Jonah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this story from the book of Jonah. I know it's hard sometimes for us to look and examine our own selves, but this is a great story where it shows us that we are inherently born evil, that we are inherently selfish creatures. We are inherently evil creatures that do things out of pride, that do things out of jealousy, that can lead to anger and can turn to us slandering you, Lord. I pray that you not let us be like that, Lord. I pray that everyone that heard this message maybe gets convicted a little bit today, God, and they look inside their own hearts, they examine themselves and say, I don't want to be like Jonah. I need to get out and I need to tell people about Christ. I need to get out and love people and not do it out of a sense of duty or not do it because you told me to. I'm supposed to do it out of a, out of a heart of love and I should rejoice with those that are rejoicing and just be glad that the kingdom is growing and not be in our own selfish flesh. I pray as we move forward in the service today, Lord, that you stay with us, that you bless our worship service, that you bless Pastor as he brings the morning message. And as always, we will give all the glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen.